welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, that is 10 ways that quality can improve contact center performance. I think is, uh, is a topic that's very, uh, very dear to everyone. I certainly seeing quality is becoming an increasingly uh, popular metric now. I think the second uh, most popular uh, metric in the contact center now outside of uh, customer satisfaction. So that's very uh, encouraging to see that. Delighted to welcome two new speakers onto our webinar program. Delighted to uh, welcome uh, Mark Ungerman from uh, Nice in Contact. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. And uh, Mark, you're going to be uh, talking through some uh, a sort of a whole, uh, if you like, a, a quality framework, how that can uh, really help improve performance. That's, that's right. I mean, we've been talking for a few minutes about how difficult it is to get traction behind a quality program. A lot of it, as we've learned in talking to some of our participants this morning, has just been um, a stagnation, if you will. But I think that when you start looking at the performance improvements, those are the types of things that really get the interest of management. And so if you can find a way to link those, uh, you can not only improve performance, but also generate a lot more interest and participation uh, in your quality initiatives. Excellent. And uh, delighted to welcome a, a new speaker to our webinar program. I've known Tom for for quite a number of years now. Tom has been a, uh, a quality blogger for uh, over, the, uh, 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 over the years and uh, really an expert on, on this. So I'm delighted to bring uh, Tom's fresh approach to uh, quality. So welcome, Tom. Thanks, John. It is. It uh, started my blog in 2006. So it's been 12 years of blogging on quality. And, and uh, we met in person about 10 years ago. So it's nice to connect. Online. Indeed, I'm amazed we haven't brought you on a webinar uh, uh, a webinar sooner. So uh, welcome, and uh, you've just launched a new company in this space, or rebranded the company as uh, Intelligentix. Yeah, thank you. Uh, formerly known as C Winger Group, we've uh, rebranded to for a 21st century audience to kind of talk a little bit more about what we do. We, we're intelligence, business intelligence, and data meets tactics and putting it to work. Excellent. So uh, I think we're going to look forward to that presentation. Just a reminder, if you want to watch a replay of today's webinar to share with your uh, executive team, there'll be a lot of detail we're going through. Uh, you can do that through callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars. That will be available from about two hours time. And if you're not already logged into our chat room, we've got quite a large number of people logged in already. Uh, here's the link of the uh, chat room. Uh, it is in another window, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. Uh, so just type that into your browser. You do need to put in your first name, last name, and email. It is in a different window. So these days, screens generally big enough have the chat room on one side, the webinar slide on the other, and uh, you can carry on the conversation there. You can ask questions. You can ask, uh, you can uh, give tips. Um, you can also download a copy of the webinar slide. So once you're logged in here uh, is a link and you can get both Tom and Mark's uh, presentations there. So uh, I would strongly advise you logging in. There is an added advantage of being logged in that we do have a prize for the best tip. Uh, if you want to use the hashtag uh, hash uh, tip for tip, here's a rather nice bottle of Brute Reserve uh, champagne, uh, or it can be a box of chocolates or an Amazon gift voucher. Uh, if you would, uh, if you would prefer, so uh, we'll be picking that uh, winning tip at the end of the uh, webinar. I know that's very, uh, very popular. So I'm just going to uh, start off before we get into the, the presentations, and I'd just like to uh, get a warm-up poll going, and I'd like to uh, ask you which measures does your quality scoring currently in, uh, include? So do you have agent performance in your quality scoring? Do you put in the contact type in the in the scoring, perhaps different scoring for different quality types? Do you have the reason for calling in your quality score? Do you have whether the problem was resolved in the uh, in the quality score? And do you actually include post call survey information into that quality score as well? I think that's going to be quite uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you've got any any thoughts of which one ones of these you uh, like to come out top. Well, I'm going to say uh, resolution is going to be on the list, and uh, I hope that folks are doing a lot of uh, post-call survey as well because you can really uh, get a better feel, I think, for why folks are calling and what their expectations are when they do call. 
OK, well, let's uh, share the results up on the screen here. 90% uh, say agent performance. I guess that's really uh, almost a given. Um, quite interesting now, 68% resolution, which is the next highest one there, uh, followed by 49% have contact type. And then uh, in sort of equal uh, equal last, but in, it's still a, a, a sizable number, have either the reason for calling or post post call survey information. Um, Tom, any any thoughts why post call survey might be as, as low as it is? I think for uh, most contact centers, the the mechanics of actually implementing a survey and doing it is uh, probably stands in the way. Perhaps there's not a good uh, internal method for doing so. The other thing that I commonly see in contact centers is that customer SAT data. Uh, is often driven by the sales team or the marketing team because they're really interested in what's uh, you know driving that from a sales and marketing perspective, and oftentimes that information doesn't translate over to the operations of the contact center, which is really sad, but it's very common. Indeed. So maybe that's the uh, the first takeaway of today uh, would be if you're not already including post call survey information in your quality scores, maybe that's the time to do it, and possibly if you can get that granular down to uh, agent level. Well, now it's probably the time to uh, dive straight into the uh, the bread and butter uh, uh, of uh, today's uh, um, uh, webinar. So, Mark, I think you're going to be taking us through uh, a framework for quality and and also touching a, a bit on how technology can also improve the uh, uh, the contact centre. So, if you'd just like to um, pop your presentation onto the uh, onto the screen, there. Yeah, we'll there we are. We can see it fine. Very good. Okay. I need to get something out of my way here. Okay. Well, listen, uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. I, I think the thing that we need to do before we really jump into our discussion is start by defining, you know, what quality is. Uh, there was a fellow um, by the name of Edward Deming. He was a 20th century engineer and a statistician, and uh, he's become regarded really as the father of modern quality management. Now, he defined quality as uh, something that had three primary attributes. Uh, the first attribute was that quality needed to exhibit a predictable degree of uniformity and dependability. The second um, um, definition was that this predictability needed to be measured consistently against a standard. And third, and probably most important, is that this standard needed to be suitable for the customer. In other words, the customer is the one who sets the standard. So if we apply this to the call center, if we want uh, predictable customer outcomes, then we really need to have a well-defined process. And this stands to reason because if agents are doing things, quote unquote, their own way, then of course you're going to have varying degrees of uh, results, which does not achieve our requirement of uh, predictability and, and uniformability. But when you do achieve predictability and uniformity, then the question becomes, how do you know whether the result is good or bad? So for example, if we're achieving a score of 50, well, that may tell us that we're achieving something with a degree of predictability, but we don't really know if 50 as a score is good or bad. So what we need now is some sort of a measuring stick and benchmarks or performance targets uh, become that measuring stick by which we determine whether or not our scores are good or bad. Now this leads us to our final consideration, where and how do we set our targets and who determines those targets? And if we reflect back on what Deming said, it's the customer uh, who sets our targets. And I think that's interesting because as we look at uh, our quick poll, I think sometimes we see that management sets our, our targets and not necessarily our customers. So we may be measuring the wrong things when we uh, consider our quality management programs. Now, it's also interesting to note that when it comes to quality, uh, the concept of good enough is okay. Uh, if we strive to overachieve quality, we could be overspending because the extra level of quality is not necessarily uh, something that our customers uh, feel like they need to have. So now that we've talked about uh, how process is used to achieve predictability and uniformity, uh, the question becomes which call center activities should be implemented as processes? And the answer is pretty much everything that your agents do. 
uh, consider the following tasks that uh, your agents do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, answering a call or transferring a call or researching a specific customer problem or uh, updating customer information, processing an order, or even documenting a call. So when we talk about agent training, it's largely about familiarizing agents with processes that handle these types of tasks. And by extension, uh, quality management is largely about assessing and approving uh, comprehension and proficiency for these tasks. Now, here's the link between quality and performance. As agents become more proficient in call center processes, not only does customer service improve, but so does call center performance. As customer interactions become more effective, the call center becomes more efficient. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a minute. Now, the performance effects of quality management can be operationally measured using a variety of indicators. Uh, all of these operational metrics are then communicated uh, to management via reports and dashboards. So from this, we can see that good reporting is key to establishing a process of continuous improvement. Uh, once processes are defined and implemented, their effects can be measured, gaps are then identified, processes are improved, and the improvement cycle uh, repeats. Now, we said earlier that our definition of quality included standards and benchmarks. So let's talk a little bit more about these. Uh, but before we go further, we need to refer to our benchmarks as performance indicators or KPIs. I think we're familiar with this language. And for the purposes of our discussion, we need to consider two kinds of KPIs, uh, these being lagging and leading. Now, lagging indicators are typically our output measurements. Uh, these are easily observable, and they're the result of one or more leading indicators. Or said another way, leading indicators determine lagging indicators. Now, here's a good example. <clears throat> if I'm trying to lose weight, when I step on the scales, I see my weight, and weight is my lagging indicator. And the calories I consume, which affect my weight, are leading indicators. Looks like I advanced a few slides here. Let me get back. Okay, so... Um, when we apply to this to the uh, call center, my lagging indicator is customer satisfaction. Now, if you look at the chart above, this is located at the far left of the diagram. This is the benchmark. It's the value that uh, is determined by our customers. This is the target that we're striving to predictably achieve. Now, operationally, there are a number of processes which affect customer satisfaction. These are measured by leading indicators. And again, looking to our diagram, this is pretty much everything to the right of our customer satisfaction KPI. So again, said another way, things like service levels with their component abandon rate and average speed of answer, as well as customer effort, call resolution, quality scores, NPS scores, all of these things and their respective components all combine to affect customer satisfaction. And to connect the dots even further, each leading KPI typically uh, is a measurement of one or more of our processes. Now, on the previous slide, I said that as service levels improve, so do call center performance. In this example, can you see how improvements in first call resolution can lead to better call center utilization? Mm -hmm. uh, when we're servicing fewer repeat calls, we're able to increase the number of available interactions, and this makes the call center more efficient. So here's some other examples of how improvements in quality can have measurable effects on performance. Again, consider how improving processes around how to research a customer problem or how to update customer information or how to process an order or how to document a call. How these things affect things like average handle time and first call resolution and other metrics that you may be measuring. When we improve the execution of these processes, we not only see improvements in customer satisfaction, but also improvements in other measures affecting call center performance. Now, when we make these efficiency gains, these give managers tremendous options to support growth without adding additional expense or to reduce labor costs. 
So improving call center quality is a discipline which provides what you might call perpetual benefits. Uh, there are a number of emerging technologies that can make managing quality much easier. So let's talk about those for just a moment. Considering those tools which help us increase consistency in our service outcomes, artificial intelligence is one of those emerging technologies that holds a tremendous amount of promise. Uh, for example, chatbots can be used to increase service uh, interactions and to do that in a highly consistent uh, fashion. Uh, artificial intelligence is also being used uh, to provide advanced uh, call routing. Uh, this is highly beneficial because you can uh, take a customer with a particular profile and make sure that that uh, customer is routed uh, to the agent that has the right skill set to uh, handle the call. Now, considering tools that help us understand customer service expectations, uh, there are a number of advanced uh, analytics uh, products that are uh, available on the market today. Uh, these are highly specialized tools which allow you to analyze your actual customer interactions. And by uh, analyzing these interactions, you're able to identify customer sentiment. And uh, understanding customer sentiment can then be used to shape your training processes and provide that uh, additional training that your, uh, your agents need. Uh, we've also talked a little bit about customer feedback. Uh, Tom mentioned that uh, many times uh, getting that uh, feedback directly from customers is, is a barrier. Uh, but there are a lot of tools that are coming on the market now that make it easier for you to implement that kind of feedback. And of course, when you have that kind of feedback, uh, it becomes an input uh, to your process definition and, uh, and your training programs. And then finally, uh, considering those tools that help us with the development and measurement of process and standards, um, there are a raft of new capabilities and new tools in the uh, area of quality management. Uh, being able to record those interactions uh, between your agents and your customers, and then to be able to go back and using a variety of techniques to be able to score those. And as you score those, identify opportunities for improvements to process, as well as to be able to provide coaching and uh, help to agents so that they become more effective and proficient. And then one that we've seen particularly uh, effective is uh, in the area of actual real-time performance management reporting. So these are tools that uh, you can actually uh, put out on the floor uh, and they list uh, different uh, performance metrics uh, by individual agents. And so uh, each agent can see in real time, uh, not only their performance, but how they perform vis-a-vis -vis others uh, on the floor. And so this notion of being able to provide real time feedback to agents has also been very, uh, very effective and very helpful. So to wrap things up, quality management is one of those high value activities that every call center manager should be engaged in. Uh, if your program needs a tune up, then here are a couple of recommendations that you might consider. First of all, going back to our definition, make sure you understand what your customers want. The benchmarks and the KPIs need to be customer centric, not management centric. Use customer surveys and other forms of follow-up to make sure that you're establishing the right benchmarks. Um, if you're not able to regularly assess uh, agent interaction and customer interaction, then consider upgrading your, uh, your tools, uh, particularly in the area of quality management. And then finally, use reporting to make sure that you're hitting your targets for quality and performance, and importantly, to also identify where improvements can be made. So the big takeaway here is that uh, quality management can not only help your organization uh, better deliver on its brand promise, but it can also help lower call center operating costs as well as improve performance. And with that, I'll turn it back. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Uh, I think there's some uh, great uh, takeaways there. I'm certainly going to look up uh, Edward Denning, the uh, father of quality, uh, who said that quality needs to be predictable, standards based and from a customer perspective and I, I think that customer's perspective i think is great that your question about uh, or denning posed who sets the targets it should be the customer that sets the uh, targets we're going to be able looking at about uh, in a in a short while about uh, who who in your organization sets the targets and it's quite uh, quite refreshing as well to see the different types of kpis there the lagging uh, things such as uh, customer satisfaction and the leading indicators such as things like service levels abandon rate. So some uh, great uh, takeaways there. So thank you very much for that, Mark. Uh, we're now going to uh, jump across and we're going to be asking uh, a drill down on which tools that you currently use 
uh, to drive your quality process. Do you, is it paper-based forms that you use? Is it spreadsheets? Is it some form of uh, a basic reporting? Do you have a dedicated quality management system? Uh, or do you use such, uh, something such as interact, uh, interaction uh, analytics? So if you'd just like to uh, uh, select uh, which quality tools that you uh, uh, use, I'm not sure if uh, this is uh, the one of many or one of all, but if you'd just like to uh, uh, put your details into that, I think this is just picking what, what is the biggest tool that you, uh, uh, you use. So let's just have a look at the uh, results there. Uh, Mark, I'm sure you'd probably see a lot of uh, a lot of spreadsheets in your uh, in your time, but we've got a, a, a sort of variety of different systems here. About 40% of the audience using quality management system. Uh, I think 8% using interaction analytics, and uh, we've got various people on spreadsheets. So quite a quite a range there. I think some quite fascinating uh, quite fascinating figures. Mark, any surprises there? Uh, not really. Uh, when we talk to customers, um, there's there's a big appetite for reporting and quality management tools. And so I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, those are being used uh, more prominently. And, and I'm sure that their uh, use will continue to climb uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Excellent. Well, we're going to jump across to the chat room and see what's been happening in the chat room. If you're already not already logged into the chat room, I see we've got about uh, 60 people who are just in the webinar, not in the chat room. Just go across this link here. Um, you have to type it into your browser, but quite straightforward. Callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. Just put in your first name, last name, and uh, email. And once you're logged into the chat room, you can also get copies of the webinar slides. Um, and uh, if you've got a tip, use hashtag tip for a tip or hashtag question for a question. Now, here you've got a uh, a question for our panelists here. Liam says, do you feel that quality measurement should be as simplified as possible? We currently have a simplified mode of just a handful of categories which we measure uh, our, our CSR operatives, or do you think it should be more thorough with more detailed categories? Tom, I don't know if you've got a, a thought on this one. Uh, I think that Simplifying it too much in a universal sense can uh, be a negative in the long run because you're not tracking everything and you may miss some things that could be great opportunities. However, I think that you can also, if you do too thorough a job all the time, I understand that that can just from an operational standpoint get really bogged down. So often we advocate a hybrid where you're taking a statistically significant number of calls and actually doing them, uh, assessing them on a very thorough basis, but you use that then to figure out where, what are the handful of elements that we really need to work on, and then maybe uh, the bulk of your assessments are just those handful of elements kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. Ah, so it sounds a bit like another case of the Goldilocks effect. Uh, not too simple, not too complex, somewhere uh, just right in the, uh, in the middle. We've got a tip in from uh, Gabby says, gaining handler or agent buy-in for your framework is critical. Involve them when you uh, when you design your quality framework. Mark, uh, presumably you'd agree with that that approach? Uh, absolutely. I mean, again, this goes back to, uh, if nothing else, just, just the training, uh, making sure that uh, people are clear on what the objectives are and, uh, you know, what's expected. Indeed, we've got a question from uh, Brandy who says, we're building a team of resolution specialists and there are many tasks that aren't measurable. For instance, time, up, time off the phones for research. Um, how, how do you measure that or quantify the things that uh, can't easily be measured? Uh, Tom, any, any advice on that? Well, I'm going to pass that one over to Mark because I think, Mark, you would agree that um, you know, things like ACW or some phone system things could actually make that measurable. Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm glad you handed the baton over. I hear this a lot. Uh, this is probably the number one complaint that we hear from folks that uh, want to upgrade uh, their contact center systems. Uh, they feel like they're, for the lack of a better term, flying blind. They don't have the data that they need to adequately manage the call center. So having uh, systems that can provide the metrics and the reporting tools that can help you uh, organize that and present the information is absolutely critical. The data is there. You just have to have the tools and the capabilities to get at it and make sense of it. 
Yeah, I, I certainly think that's uh, that's great. I mean, one of the common criticisms of my hair is that you know uh, the relatively small sample size, and you know people saying, you know, I handle you know seventy five calls a day every month, and you pick four calls to beat me up on. Um, you know, that's just not fair. Uh, so you know, I guess there's lots of other elements that need to to be built into it. Uh, built into it. Uh, Hannah says we have re review forms which include the average handling time. I guess it's very similar, which outlines the uh, the, the, the contact center target. However, we do not use these for the overall performance rate of the employee. We firmly believe a call will take as long as it takes to get resolved. However, the agents know whereabouts they should be time-wise. Now, um, whether average handling time should be an agent uh, target is probably another another webinar. I, I know that there's um, a Goodhart's law says that when a uh, uh, when an indicator becomes a, a target, it ceases to be a ceases to be a, a good target. And I'd always caution against average handling time. Tom, what's your your take on this? Well, I'm glad that Hannah brought this up because it is a, a real common uh, discussion within contact centers. Here's where we have found the wisdom to be. Uh, average handle time can be a great indicator to look at when you're looking at a large sample of phone calls. The problem is when you put something into your scorecard where uh, you have an average handle time target, like say three minutes, and anybody gets docked if that call goes over three minutes, you're gonna drive bad behavior and you're gonna drive customer dissatisfaction when agents start hanging up on customers or rushing customers if the call takes longer. Where you can find um, kind of a nice balance is always look at the agent performance over a large data set so you can see averages. And if somebody is way over average, you may need to dig into why that's happening. That being said, I think that it's also possible to have an element in your scorecard, such as uh, uh, efficiently manages the length of the call. So if I'm listening to that call and I say, you know what, this call could have been a three minute phone call. You took 15 minutes because you went to the wrong systems and you weren't looking in the right place and you uh, you just ha you could have done better. I think that's a valid reason to you know to assess them and coach them about that. Mm, indeed, and there's certain techniques as well that can also help with uh, average handling time. One of those uh, Carolyn Blunt talked about on a recent webinar is signposting. So one of those classic ones where you say, "I'm going to give you a reference number. Have you got a pen to write it down with?" And people go, "Oh, hang on, I'll just I'll go off and find a pen." Whereas if you say uh, in a little while, I'm going to give you a reference number. It might be handy to have a pen. They can sort of rummage through their pockets or through the, the drawer or even shout out to get a pen. So they don't, you don't have that gap of, you know, a minute while someone tries to find a pen to write down the, the reference number. That's a, if you type uh, signposting into the search box on Call Center Help, I'm sure you'd find that. Um, Raina's uh, put in a, a, a question for Mark. Uh, Mark, you referred to proficiency in process as one of the key drivers for quality. What about, for instance, proficiency in product uh, troubleshooting? I guess this is on the help desk. Uh, are there any tips of how to uh, organize continuous learning for this? So uh, how, would you, how would you handle that, Mark? Well, you know, obviously that's gonna be different uh, for every organization and for every product. Um, I think that when it comes down to it, uh, it, it really puts the emphasis on the process itself. And when you adopt this notion of continuous improvement, start by uh, coming up with your best uh, uh, effort in terms of what those processes should be and getting your people trained on providing that level of support using those processes, how to, how to effectively troubleshoot, uh, how to get people to the right resources so that they can solve uh, the problems and the questions that they have, and then measure uh, those effects. And if they're getting you back to the targets that you feel you need to have, then those processes are working. Uh, if they're still short, then look for ways to improve those. Uh, but again, uh, those are going to be different uh, for every customer, but not every customer, every company and, and every product uh, that, that you might be trying to support. Indeed. Well, we've got a couple of tips before we jump across to uh, Tom's presentation. Uh, Lisa has said feedback scores to advisors with comments and recordings. These comments can include constructive feedback as well as well done, which I think are very important. And the recording will help the advisor to see if their uh, if their view of quality matches yours. That's, I certainly uh, definitely believe that uh, uh, advisors should have their own uh, own recordings. In fact, there's a a technique of agent self-scoring. Tom, I, I 
I don't know if you're a fan of this, but I've seen it quite uh, uh, work quite well, where you know the advisor is almost more critical of their performance than the uh, than the coach. I think that's absolutely true. We found the same thing. Uh, it, it's always a good thing, self scoring. Uh, I have found over the years as a call coach in my coaching activities that when you allow people to sort of score themselves and judge themselves, nine times out of 10, I'm trying to build them up because they've been so critical of themselves and really want to do a good job. So I think it's a, it's a great tool. Uh, excellent. And here's a tip that's come in from uh, Matthew said, eight best practice principles are used to measure scorecards and agent performance. These are set by managers. The agents are then given the opportunity to determine which highest rank six are the best for them in a way that both the business and agents achieve a balanced scorecard that they built together. Mark, that looks quite a nice uh, approach of um, a sort of bit of a combination there. I like the uh, democratization, if you will. <clears throat> uh, I hope that part of that process though is taking into account uh, what customers consider uh, acceptable targets. Indeed, I think that goes back to that uh, uh, comment by uh, Denning on uh, customer sets the targets. Well, let's have a look at who does indeed set the uh, targets. Uh, in fact, I've got one on here that um, uh, what drives your criteria, and I probably have a, should have a box on here for, for customers, but if, you, uh, if your customers set it, if you'd like to leave that answer in the, uh, uh, in the chat room. So what drives the questions that you use on your criteria for quality? Is it things like compliance? Is it customer satisfaction data? Is it driven by an executive sponsor who wants a particular thing built into the quality? Is it built by, the, I say, a department manager? Is it built by, you know, is it driven by committee? What is it? What are the some of the things that drive your uh, your your criteria in there? Uh, and and how do you come come about with uh, what was what was driving it on there? I think it's going to be quite um, quite fascinating ones here. I think we've got most people. Uh, voted sample size here of 104. So, um, Tom, if you uh, see the results there, it looks like compliance is the uh, is the biggest single one. Customer satisfaction comes up quite high. Um, it looks like executive sponsorship doesn't seem to be uh, fit very well on that on that quality. Is that just too detached from from the, the senior levels? Would you say? I think that that can uh, largely be also determined by the, the size of the operation. If you're talking about a large uh, contact center in a global corporation, there is a lot of detachment. Uh, we do a lot of work with small to mid-sized contact centers where it's much more direct and the executives like to have the say in what they expect their employees to do. So I think that can be a big factor. Excellent. Well, probably a good time now, Tom, to hand over to your thoughts on how to improve a a, a quality program. So if you just like to um, pop your slides up on the screen there. We'll do that. Let start there the we slide show here. Excellent. So just to uh, go back to Mark's presentation, I really appreciate what Mark had to say. And back when uh, our company started working on service quality in the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, Deming was the foundation of how we built all of our uh, processes and philosophies towards customer satisfaction and service quality. So we believe also in centering things on the customer. I've got six different things that I'd like to bring up with regards to measuring quality and uh, how it can make a difference in your contact center performance. Where Mark was really talking about systems and some of the systems in the in the, the process of creating a program, I want to really drill down to how do you take customer set data and turn that into criteria that is going to drive customer satisfaction. Because that's really what Intelligentix Teams does. Uh, we believe in creating that process where you take data from customer chat, put it into your QA scorecard, make sure that the QA scorecard and criteria you're measuring are the things that are going to give your agents what they need in order to then drive that customer satisfaction. So the first tip here is know who is defining quality in your organization. And our poll just said there's a lot of compliance, which I would imagine might be industry-wide or even internal company-wide. 
And 60% of you said that there is uh, some customer satisfaction or CSAT data that's driving that information. So if that is uh, the case, that's awesome, but there's still 40% of you that really haven't made that connection. What our team here at Intelligentix does is we begin with customer research. And when we work with our client companies, we'll start by doing a customer SAT survey, a post-call survey, contacting customers 24 to 48 hours after they've interacted with somebody in the contact center, asking them a battery of questions and testing different dimensions of service that would impact the customer satisfaction. Armed with that data, we then create the communication quality assessment scorecard, whether that's email or chat or phone, which it's usually phone. And we create the criteria by which we listen to the phone calls. By the time we get to actually training and coaching the agents, we have data from both what customers expect and data from what's actually taking place on the phones or in emails with which to train and coach those agents. And then it works in sort of a cycle of continuous improvement. And we have clients that we've been for over 20 years basically going around this cycle. And while each of the dots kind of evolves over time with technology, uh, the process remains relatively the same. But the customer, if you'll notice, is in the center. We want to keep things centered on what the customer expects, just like Deming said. So know who's defining quality, and hopefully it's the customer. You want to get reliable data on what drives your customer satisfaction. So that's the second piece. So let me describe a little bit about what our team does when we're doing customer sat. As I mentioned, we'll go out, we'll do a post-call survey, we'll gather the data from that. And there could be two different ways, depending on the scope of the survey, that our clients will see those drivers of customer satisfaction. The drivers are determined, but we work with the client to decide which different uh, performance dimensions are we going to test. So by looking at how the customer views their overall satisfaction with the company and the experience, and then looking at how they rate different dimensions of service, we can quantify which of those dimensions of service have the greatest impact on that customer's overall satisfaction. So we, the number of uh, performance indicators we test kind of depends on how long you want that survey to be and how willing your customers are to sit there and answer a lot of questions. Typically, we'll whittle it down to about 10 to 15 in a, uh, a basic survey. So this is a pie chart that shows what the key drivers are of the you know, 13 or so dimensions that we tested. Resolution, no surprise, is the number one driver in the pie chart there, 46% of that customer's overall SAT is determined by resolution. We also found that there were a couple of dimensions that were correlated to that. So offers appropriate solutions to meet the need was correlated in the customers like, did I really get resolution to this? And then listening without interrupting. So uh, were you really listening to me uh, so that you could resolve the right issue was also highly correlated to that customer's perception of resolution and knowledge. Courtesy and friendliness, answers without holds or transfers, being open when needed, which was an interesting dimension that we tested. Uh, in some of the smaller to mid-sized contact centers we worked with, their center may be open just during business hours. So the clients are always wondering, should we pay people to stay later in the night? Should we hire a contract call center to answer calls uh, over the overnight hours or over weekends? So that can be a, a key piece of, of data and intelligence that uh, our clients would be interested in. Now, I'd like to show you a different way of looking at this, and it's called a quadrant analysis interpretation. So in this case, we're gonna look at some of the, where those same uh, drivers are. In the pie chart, we just saw what the, the, the key drivers were. Now we're gonna look at, on this map, where all of the different dimensions of service landed. So along the axis there on the left side, you've got importance. So if the dot with the dimension is lower on the chart, it means it's of lower importance to the customer. The higher the dot is vertically on the chart, the more important it is in driving the customer satisfaction. Along the uh, bottom axis, the horizontal axis, you've got actual 
uh, satisfaction and we call it top to box. So we will typically do a five point scale, very satisfied, satisfied, neutral, dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied. So what we've plotted on the map is where each of those dimensions services landed in the percentage of top two box of the customers who said they were either satisfied or very satisfied with that dimension of service. If that dimension ends up in the upper right-hand corner there, it's their customers are very satisfied with it and it's very important. So those are key strengths. You don't want to, you want to keep measuring those. You want to keep working on those because if it's a key strength, you don't want to lose ground in the customer's mind. Towards the right, if it's in that lower right-hand corner, customers are very satisfied, but it's not as important. So we would say those are expected strengths. Yep, you, I'm, I'm very happy with it, but it's not that important to me. And we'll oftentimes find that when a contact center really works on certain dimensions of service, the more customers feel that they're always going to get it, the less important it comes over time. Mm -hmm. In the lower left-hand corner, we have dimensions that are not as important. Also, I'm not very happy about that, but because it's not as important, it may not be what you want to spend your time, energy, and resources improving because it's a minor factor. Where you really want to focus are the things that are in that upper left-hand quadrant, where customers are not as satisfied and it's very important to them. So let me show you an actual quadrant map with some of the dimensions of service that we tested. Let me give you a couple of examples here that we talked about earlier of how this can be helpful in figuring out what you need to do. I mentioned that we have contact centers are saying, hey, should we uh, staff up to stay open in the overnight hours or have a 24 seven contact center or over the weekends? On this particular map, you'll see that being open when needed, while only 88% of customers were satisfied or very satisfied, so it's in that lower quadrant uh, towards the left, but it's not very important. It's lower on the map. Whereas up here in the upper left-hand corner, what's very important, and it is the lowest rated satisfaction wide, is quickness in reaching a CSR. So if I'm the management team for this particular client, I'm thinking, where I'm going to get the biggest bang for my buck as far as uh, resources goes is if I actually staff up during my regular business hours, making sure that customers can get through to an agent quickly or find efficiencies within the phone calls to make sure that I'm customers can get through and get through the queue more quickly and get to an agent and being open when needed. I'm going to leave that one alone for now and make sure that I keep an eye on it as time goes on. As you look through the rest of these, you can see that we've got all sorts of different dimensions and kind of where they sit. The nice thing about this is it gives you as a contact center a map by which you can say, where do we put our emphasis with our agents as far as improving quality and making sure that we're driving customer satisfaction? And where do we have some strengths that, and it, even when it comes to weighting a scorecard, which criteria, which behaviors are more important? And so when I'm factoring that overall service index or that overall service on my scorecard, some things are going to need to be weighted more heavily in that calculation of overall service because they're more important to customers. So things that might factor into, say, resolving the customer's issue, uh, offering an appropriate solution, timeliness of follow-up. I'm gonna be thinking about what are the behaviors that might impact this in the customer's mind? And I'm gonna weight those things more heavily than for example, using the customer's name, which customers are very satisfied by that, but it's definitely lower on the map. So I still want to be courtesy, courteous and friendly. Uh, and so using the customer's name is still a good thing to do, but it's definitely not as important in the customer's mind as some of the other dimensions. Hopefully that helps. So let me, I'm gonna dig into this a little bit more about how we translate these different dimensions of service into actual criteria. The third, the third tip here is to consider ways that CSR's words can influence the key drivers because what's in the CSR's control is what I say and how I say it. So let me give you some examples. The CSR may not be able to resolve an issue or may struggle to resolve an issue uh, based on what 
they're allowed to do and what the system allows them to do and what information that they have. So they may be constrained, but they can influence resolution in a couple of different ways. One is, um, for example, an ownership statement. And a lot of contact centers we work with like this technique. An ownership statement is simply a statement at the beginning of the call where a customer says, yep, I'd like to check on the status of my order. An ownership statement is, hey, I would be happy to check on that for you. Could I have your order number, please? Simply by stating, I would be happy to help you. I'm going to take care of you today. I'm going to, I'm going to do this for you, and I'm responsible. I'm taking ownership for your issue. That can leave a positive impression in the customer's mind. So when we get to that post-call survey, they're thinking about not only did they give me my order status and do it, but they really acted like they cared, like they wanted to do it, that they had a good attitude. That might be enough to push a customer from satisfied to very satisfied when they're judging resolution. Another example, making a complete effort. We just did a, a, a email survey for a assessment for a client. And what we found was in the emails, oftentimes agents, who are also, you know, the, their bosses are looking at the number of emails that they are answering per hour or per day. And so when a customer said, hey, can you reset my password or something to that effect, the agents were very quickly responding with, what's your user ID? So what's happening is they're putting the burden back on the customer to then respond with the user ID, even though if the agent would simply look up that customer a different way, they could find that user ID. They could find that customer in a number of different ways within the system. But what the CSRs were thinking is, I'm just gonna put the burden back on the customer to tell me what their user ID is. Maybe they won't respond and I won't have to do it. In the meantime, my number of emails answered are going up. Well, obviously that's not gonna be good for customer satisfaction. So on the scorecard, we had, did you make a complete effort? And any time that happened, we knew that you could have found that yourself if you made a little effort. So they were marked down under the category of resolution for not making a complete effort to resolve the issue. Appropriate systems. Did you access the appropriate systems? Were you efficient in your navigation to control managing the length of that call? Uh, acknowledging the queue. So I may not be able to control how quickly I get through, a uh, customer gets through the queue to me, but if I know that quickness in reaching is the number one driver and it is the lowest rated in satisfaction, I can influence that customer simply by answering the call. Hey, thank you so much for waiting. I apologize for the wait. My name is Tom, how can I help you today? By simply acknowledging it, empathizing with them, apologizing for the wait, that can diminish the dissatisfaction that that customer may feel and that might show up for positive results in your post call survey. So these are examples. Uh, courtesy, please and thank you. I wanted to mention this because Jonti has a question that he's going to be asking in just a few minutes. What we have found in our CSAT data is as uh, more and more millennials get into the workforce and contact centers, we have found that the number of agents that were just raised with the understanding of simple courtesies of a please or a thank you are diminishing. Mm -hmm. We did a pilot assessment for a client just about a year ago, about 20, uh, 12 CSRs, mostly in that uh, 20s, uh, young 20s range. And we were listening in their assessment for when they asked for an account number, because every call in this particular assessment, the agent had to ask for an account number in order to access the customer's information. We listened for a please or a thank you with, when they made one of the first two requests, which is either the account number or some verification information. So just one little please or one little thank you. And what we found is only 6% of phone calls did the customer ever hear a please or thank you when that agent was asking them for, for several pieces of information. Lowest that I've ever seen in the 25 years that I've been doing this. So we implemented that and said, hey, anytime you ask for that account number, let's just get a please or a thank you when you ask it so that that will impact that customer's perception of courtesy and friendliness. And in fact, Tom, probably now is a good time as any to actually go across and uh, and uh, quickly do that poll now. So we're just going to That's ask good. the question: uh, Do you do your quality questions include courtesy phrases? Uh, for instance, please and thank you. Do you have it 
uh, do you have it yes? Do you have it only in the greeting or closing statements? Or do you not look at whether people include those uh, uh, courtesy phrases, uh, please and thank you? So I think we've got uh, most people here voted. And um, yeah, quite a, quite a range. And I'll just share the uh, results here. It does look like a lot of people do have it in their quality program, but uh, about a quarter only actually look at it at the beginning and the end of the the, the, the call. Uh, so I think there's pro potentially Tom, a little bit of um, area for improvement there. Absolutely. And it's one of the things that we talk to our clients about often is that this represents an op uh, a really uh, opportunity, a key opportunity to differentiate yourself from your clients or your competitors. Because if your competitors are not doing that, they're not measuring it, and all of a sudden your customers find that you're providing a level of courtesy that they don't hear from others that uh, that can be a key differentiator for you in the long run in customer satisfaction fourth tip here and we're getting down to the uh the end i'm watching my time here i want to stay in bounds measure the customer experience beyond csr performance and from the poll we took earlier i see that many of you are doing some of those things like making sure that you are looking at uh, call types, uh, resolution, those types of things. So let me just explain why that's important uh, for a number of reasons. For example, outside of the CSR control, was it ultimately resolved? Sometimes the CSR impacts that by the effort they make, so on. But oftentimes the CSR can do everything in their power, but it's simply not resolved because of something that's out of their control. So measuring which calls are unresolved and why can be important. We also commonly find in our research that the number of contacts to resolve uh, drives a diminishment of satisfaction exponentially. Usually two contact resolved, there's a diminishment of satisfaction, but it's fairly minor in most situations. It's when you get to the three or four uh, contacts to resolve that customers really get upset. So by measuring that, even if you hear a customer say, look, this is the fourth time I've called or the fifth time I've called and I, I can't get this taken care of, you as a QA analyst need to prick up your ears, you need to flag that call and you need to begin looking into those things. Why, why did it take three or four contacts? Uh, and if we can identify some systemic issues, that can make a big difference. Uh, the number of contacts, um, is important. How many times does it take? Uh, information access. How long does it take from the point I give you my account number to when the CSR has it up in on their screens and begins to uh, get to the information? Uh, we had a client just recently where we heard a whole bunch of agents saying, well, I can't get to that information because I don't have access to that system. Why not? Uh, it was a no-brainer. Management, why have you not given your agents uh, access to a system that they're going to need in order to answer questions. Quickness, uh, staffing, queue times uh, can, can play a big part of it. Proper training, as you get in and you hear agents beginning to say, I, I don't know the answer to this, uh, you could have something on your, on your analysis form that says, hey, this agent didn't have the training they needed in order to answer this question. And as you track that over time, that could help your training department to say, hey, we need to make sure that we're covering this in our new hire training or those types of things. Uh, standard lead times. You'll notice on the, the quadrant map I showed you earlier that timeliness of follow-up was one of the dimensions that we look at. And what we have found in our research across all clients is that timeliness, quickness, time-related elements are increasing in uh, importance to customers. So uh, how long is it taking to get back to them? A timely, uh, so again, what the CSR can control is what I say to the customer. Instead of saying shortly, am I saying I'll be back to you by the end of the day? Instead of saying I'll get back to you in a bit, which is open to interpretation, they can say I should be back to you within the hour. That can make a difference in customer satisfaction. But on the management side, are we providing our agents with standard lead times for anything that we might be uh, following up correspondence line? Standard things, shipping things, sending information out, 
getting back to them on certain questions. There should be a standard time frame that CSRs are enabled with to be able to provide to those customers, and that's something that, that management uh, should have on their checklist. And then courtesy. Agents handle it, of course, what they say and how they say it. What's out of their control is how courteous and friendly and easy that IVR is that's routing the call to the CSR. And I'll tell you that most contact centers, most companies don't think at all about the message on their IVR. It is robotic. It's somebody from IT that was tapped to record the message. It sounds awful and it's not a great first impression. So hire somebody, get a voice actor to uh, and a writer to create a really fun script uh, that that sounds great and gives that positive first impression. And that can impact satisfaction as well as make the customer a little bit happier by the time they get to that CSR. So those are some examples of things outside of CSR control that you can glean sometimes just from listening and tracking your uh, assessments. Number five, track customer contact resolution outcomes. A good example, let me give you an example of this. We had a client that was in the uh, cable television business and we heard, uh, which as we track contact reasons and reasons for contact, we had a couple of months where we saw a huge spike in customers who were calling just to say, hey, I sent my check, don't turn off my service. I'm, I sent in my payment, please don't cut me off. We hadn't heard this before and it was sort of strange. So we were able to go back to our client and ask, you know, kind of bring this up, say, hey, we're hearing this. They dug into it and found that the financial lockbox provider that's supposed to process their customer's checks had been, uh, had been sitting on the customer's checks sometimes for days or even a week or more before processing in them. And in the meantime, the customer service is getting cut off. Simply by digging into finding out that that was happening, they were able to change lockbox providers and, and kind of all of a sudden now these unnecessary calls to say, hey, just, just call to tell you I sent my check. They went away and they were able to calculate a large savings simply by uh, figuring out that that was happening. Resolution outcomes as well. Uh, often Tom, we're just uh, running a, a little low on time now, and I know you had one other point you wanted to cover before yeah. we... Uh, Excellent. Uh, last, last point here. Uh, exceptional situations may be addressed systemically to diminish diminished satisfaction uh, or diminished dissatisfaction. So keep in mind that while uh, some of the things that we're listening for are uh, situations that we want to, to increase satisfaction, look at things like what are the calls that, let's look at every call that took an extraordinary amount of time. Instead of our, our average uh, handle time is four minutes, let's pull 30 calls that took over 10 minutes, listen to all of them, figure out why, and see if systemically we can see some trends and ways to do that. Same thing with, um, with the number of contacts to resolve. Those are opportunities for you to dig in, do a little uh, analysis on just those calls that we know are probably going to diminish uh, our customer satisfaction. Wonderful. <laughs> yep. I'll hand it back to you. There's a little conclusion screen, but we can uh, chat as we move forward. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Tom. I think some great uh, takeaways I've made there. Uh, certainly plotting things from uh, what uh, will have the biggest impact on customer satisfaction as part of your quality process. Uh, courtesy and friendliness, certainly a very, uh, uh, very important. Listening without interruption was one you, you took I talked about. I like the tip about if the if there's been a long wait to get through, then it's quite important for customer satisfaction just to acknowledge that and say uh, sorry. I thought it's quite interesting that it may not be first contact resolution we need to measure, but perhaps second contact resolution, um, maybe more more you know making sure it gets no more than two. And uh, I think also uh, another takeaway might be to review how courteous our IVR messages are. We just got time for a couple of tips from the uh, audience. Susan has said, we use soft skills as part of our quality parameters. Uh, we call them core skills here, and they include things such as empathy, enthusiasm, uh, recogn recognizing objections, uh, motivation, positivity, tolerance, integrity, politeness, 
and lots more. I think there's some uh, uh, some great uh, great ones there. Uh, Jeffrey says, I tell our new hires, please and thank yous are free and you have an unlimited supply of them. So please feel free to give them out as much as possible. Tom, I guess that ties very nicely with what you were talking through. Absolutely. Okay, let's have a look. And um, Mark, quite a nice one from Sean. Ensure the quality process outlines the KPIs and these are communicated to staff and reflected upon during the year within the personal development review process. Uh, have a thorough training plan in place to identify the gaps within the within the process. Mark, you were talking very much about the need to tie in with training. Right on. Yep. Excellent. Well, uh, we've uh, unfortunately reached the uh, top of the hour. Uh, as a bit of uh, quality feedback for us, if you could type into the uh, chat room uh, in one or two words, what did you like best about the webinar or any areas for improvement? We do have a survey that you can fill in as well. The winning tip today is from Matthew, who says the eight best practice principles are used to measure scorecards and agent performance. These are set by the managers. And um, we do have a, a post webinar survey where we can get all the uh, all the feedback. So if you'd like to feed that back in, uh, if you'd like to have a demonstration of how uh, the nice in contact uh, uh, product, I'm sure Mark would be uh, only too happy to arrange that for you. Just fill that into the webinar survey. You can watch the replay in about an hour's time. And I'd just like to say thank you very much to our two speakers for joining us today. Uh, Mark, thank you uh, for, for getting up so early to join us. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, Tom, thank you for sharing all your wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful insight. There are a few questions we've not been able to an answer. We will circulate with those with our uh, speakers and see if we can get you uh, answers back. Thanks very much. And we look forward to uh, seeing you next week. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.